good morning or afternoon as the case may be whatever it is so this unit is on Jacksonian democracy and we've talked about the Jeffersonian era and how he approached how to rule the United States or how to govern the United States and and he was an anti-federalist also known as Democratic Republican and so now we're gonna look at how Jackson and his supporters viewed how to govern the United States and that's why it's called Jacksonian democracy um, you know stemming from what Andrew Jackson or how he ruled some people liked it and some people didn't so if you look at the political cartoon here to the right um, just see if you think this is a positive or negative image and while you're thinking about that I will continue so when James Monroe began his second term as president in 1821 he rejoiced at the idea that the country was no longer divided by political parties which he considered quote the curse of the country breeding disunity and corruption yet even before Monroe's second term had ended new political divisions had already begun to evolve creating an increasingly democratic system of politics so before Andrew Jackson became president during James Monroe's administration there was only really one party which is good because that signifies stability but then that also means there's no really democratic process if there's only one party to vote for then it's not democratic so think about this how long does unity really last in any situation have you thought about it in any situation in a relationship in uh, teams of whatever if you want to say athletics um, government corporations unity does not last long now there may be like an overarching theme but even within the group the theme uh, can't always hold people together so it doesn't to be quite honest unity does not last long because there's no perfect union so to speak so in 1821 American politics was still still largely dominated by s submission and respect to whoever's in authority <clears throat> competing political parties were non-existent and voters generally deferred to the leadership of local elites or leading families political campaigns tended to be relatively state affairs direct appeals by candidates for support were actually considered poor in taste so like if you were running for office it would be in poor taste to go and ask someone for their vote during this time election procedures were by later standards quite undemocratic most states imp imposed a property and tax paying requirements on the white adult males who alone had the vote and they conducted voting by voice now think about that if you are voting by voice then everybody can hear who you're voting for so there might be a little pressure to vote a certain way that's not really democratic presidential electors were generally chosen by the state legislatures given the fact that citizens had only the most indirect say in the election of the president it is not surprising that voting participation was generally extremely low amounting to less than 30 percent of adult white males so between 1820 and 1840 a revolution took place in American politics in most states property qualifications for voting and office holding were repealed and voting by voice was largely eliminated direct methods of selecting presidential electors county officials state judges and governors replaced indirect methods because of these and other political innovations voter participation skyrocketed by 1840 voting participation had reached unprecedented levels nearly 80 percent of adult white males went to the polls so because they took off the limitations or the restrictions on who could vote more people were able to express and then did express their opinion through voting 
people. I really mean, you know, adult white males. A new two-party system uh, made possible by an expanded electorate replaced the politics of deference or submission and respect to uh, and leadership by elites. So, so we're, we're talking about the elites, people who were rich, white, educated, who were considered elites were not just not always likely to be running for a candidacy. By the mid-1830s, two national political parties with marked philosophical differences, strong organizations, and wide popular appeal competed in virtually every state. Professional party managers used partisan newspapers, speeches, parades, rallies, and barbecues to mobilize popular support. Our modern political system that we have today was born at that po point in time. The most significant political innovation of the early 19th century was the abolition of property qualifications for voting and office holding, meaning you didn't have to own property to be an elected official. That's pretty huge. Hard times resulting from a finance, financial panic of 1819 led many people to demand an end to property restrictions on voting and office holding. In New York, for example, fewer than two adult males and five could legally vote for senator or governor. Under the new constitution adopted in 1821, all adult white males were allowed to vote, so long as they had paid taxes or served in the militia. Five years later, an amendment to the state's constitution eliminated the tax paying and militia qualifications, thereby establishing universal whitehood manhood, white manhood suffrage. Now, a lot of people are like, well, suffrage? What were they suffering? No, suffrage means the right to vote. By 1840, universal white manhood suffrage had largely become a reality. Only three states Louisiana, Rhode Island, and Virginia still restricted the suffrage to white male property owners and taxpayers. In order to encourage popular participation in politics, most states also instituted statewide nominating conventions, opened polling places in more convenient locations, extended the hours that they were open, and eliminated the earlier practice of voting by voice. So that's cool. So now more people could actually get to a place where they could vote and if they worked late hours and they could actually go to the polling station and vote. The same thing applies today. I think voting in Washington County opens at 7 a.m. and closes at 7 or 7.30 p.m. So that allows people who are um, working a night shift or a late shift can actually be able to go vote and you cannot get fired because you went and voted so there's a law that says you have the right to go vote even during work hours if if possible so while universal white manhood suffrage was becoming a re reality, restrictions on voting by African Americans and women remained in force, of course. Only one state, New Jersey, had given unmarried women, property holders, the right to vote following the revolution. Unfortunately, the state rescinded this right at the time and extended suffrage to all adult white men. Most states also explicitly denied the right to vote to free African Americans. By 1858, free blacks were eligible to vote in just four northern states, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, and Vermont. So the democratic impulse that swept the country in the 1820s was also apparent in widespread attacks on special privilege and aristocratic pretension, meaning people who were rich and had this idea that they were above everybody else and was somehow like royalty um, within society you know people were like mm, yeah that's not cool please don't act like that so like groups like churches the bench which means the court you know like if you were a judge um, and the legal and medical professions all saw their elite 
status status diminished so just because you were among these groups didn't mean you were all that in a bag of chips and so they weren't treated as such either the judiciary became more responsive to public opinion through election rather than appointment of judges to open up the legal profession many states dropped formal training requirements to practice law some states also abolished training and licensing requirements for physicians allowing unorthodox urban root doctors, including many women, to compete freely with established physicians. The surge of democratic feeling had an important political consequence, the breakdown of the politics of deference and its vocabulary. The 18th century language of politics, which included such terms as faction, junto, and caucus, was rooted in an elite-dominated political order. During the first quarter of the 19th century, a new democratic political vocabulary emerged that drew its words from everyday language. Instead of, instead of standing for public office, candidates ran for office. Politicians log-rolled, or made deals, or straddled the fence, or promoted pork barrel legislation, which means programs that would benefit their own people. That word or phrase pork barrel is still used today. So even words on how, you know, are so important, I can't even begin to describe. Though so people did not vote in the 1820s because of this feeling of elitism and who wants to vote for people who are going to look down upon you that's why a whole lot of people didn't vote but now that you're changing the vocabulary f that everybody can understand and use then it opens a wider door for more people to actually express their opinion so during the first quarter of the 19th century local elites lost much of their influence they were replaced by professional politicians in the 1820s, political innovators such as Martin Van Buren, the son of a tavern keeper, and Thurlow Weed, a newspaper editor in Albany, New York, devised new campaign tools such as torchlight parades, newspapers that were kind of biased towards a candidate, and nominating conventions. These political bosses and manipulators soon discovered that the most successful technique for arousing popular interest in politics was to attack a privileged group or institution that had used political influence to attain power or profit. So uh, does this still happen today? Now think about the campaign that we just went through. You know, the two candidates that ran, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, they attacked each other. They didn't really expound on what they themselves were going to do as president. Um, a lot of the attacks had to do with you know, from Trump's opinion, you know, Clinton was a professional politician who used um, corrupt ways to get what she wanted done. And then Clinton accused Trump of being an unprofessional, no experience kind of candidate. So they're attacking each other. So this is this campaign that we've just gone through is nothing new and I'm going to talk about how Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams campaigned against each other and it was just as bad okay so again there's nothing new under the Sun I just want to throw that out there to you <clears throat> okay so the Anti-Masonic Party was the first political movement to win widespread popular following using this attack, this technique um, for attacking the other side. In the mid-1820s, a growing number of people in New York and surrounding states had come to believe that members of the Fraternal Order of Freemasons, who seemed to monopolize many of the region's most prestigious political offices and business positions, had used their connections to enrich themselves. They noted, for instance, that Masons held 22 of the nation's 24 governorships. Hmm. Then, in 1826, in the small town of Batavia, New York, William Morgan, a former Mason, disappeared. 
Morgan had written an expose of the organization in violation of the order's vow of silence, and rumor soon spread that he had been tied up with heavy cables and dumped into the Niagara River. When no indictments were brought against the alleged perpetrators of Morgan's kidnapping and presumed murder, many upstate New Yorkers accused local constables, justices of the peace, and judges who were members of the Masons of obstruction of justice. By 1830, the anti-Mason movement had succeeded in capturing half the vote in New York State and had gained substantial support throughout New England. In the mid-1830s, the anti-Masons were absorbed into a new national party called the Whigs, and we'll talk about them in a minute. So, to sum up, new political parties sprung out of attacking the privileged class or the upper class and they gained a lot of support such as the anti-masonic party so the first years of the new republic had given rise to two competing political parties the federalists and the anti-federalists also known as the democratic republicans the first two parties unlike the present-day political parties tended to have a strong sectional character with the federalists being up in new england or the northern states and the republicans elsewhere so after the war of 1812 the nation went back to a period of a one-party government in national politics the decline of the Federalist Party created the illusion of national public unity, but appearances are deceiving. Without the discipline imposed by competition with a strong opposition party, the Republican Party began to fragment into cliques and factions. So what they're saying is, even though there's one party, it's actually good to have competition because it keeps the other party in check. Does that make sense? So if you're just left alone to do whatever you want, then there's no other group kind of watching over you, if that makes sense. <clears throat> so during James Monroe's presidency, the Republican Party disintegrated as a stable national organization. Following his overwhelming victory in 1816, Monroe sought to promote the ideal expressed by George Washington in his farewell address, a nation free of political parties. Uh, like Washington, he appointed rival faction leaders such as John Quincy Adams and John C. Calhoun to his cabinet. So what he's doing is he put people who were not part of his party as his advisors. So now you have different um, perspectives, which, is, which can be good, but it can also be bad. He also refused to use favoritism to strengthen the Republican Party, which I think also is good like he didn't pick his favorites to govern um, which does you know just because you pick people who you know or are your friends doesn't mean that they're good leaders or capable of the job that you pick them for so in that way I think he was he's commendable so James Monroe also took the position that Congress not the president was the best representative of the public will and therefore should define public policy which also makes sense to me because Congress is a representation of the people from all over the United States and they are the ones that are creating the laws based on what the people say so I understand what his perspective was on on what the presidential power should be like unfortunately I don't think he was a strong leader um, and because of that it led to uh, splits within the Republican Party during his presidency so over time local and personal conflict began to come together into a new political party system three critical factors contributed to the creation of the second party system the first was the financial panic of 1819 and the depression and there were really a lot of differences on how to fix it and so because no one could come to a general conclusion or solution they just like went to their corners and sulked okay now a second source of political division was the southern alarm over the slavery debates in Congress in 1819 and 1820 so you know about the Missouri crisis that happened in 1819 1820 and so there are a lot of people in Congress nervous about 
what would happen in terms of making laws for or against slavery. Though so the third major source of political division was the selection of presidential candidates. In the election of 1824, Jackson received the greatest number of votes both at the polls and in the electoral college, followed in electoral votes by Adams, Crawford, and then Clay. But Jackson failed to receive the constitutionally required majority of the electoral votes. So, in the Constitution, in the Twelfth Amendment, the election was given to the House of Representatives, which was required to choose from among the top three candidates in the Electoral College. There, Henry Clay persuaded his supporters to vote for Adams, commenting acidly that he did not believe, quote, that killing 2,500 Englishmen at New Orleans, quote, unquote, was a proper qualification for the presidency. And then Adams was elected on the first ballot. A newspaper, the Philadelphia Observer, accused Adams of making a secret deal to get Clay's support. Three days later, Adams' nomination of Clay as Secretary of State seemed to confirm the charges of a corrupt bargain. Jackson was outraged since he could legitimately argue that he was the popular favorite. The general exclaimed, quote, The Judas of the West has closed the contract and will receive the 30 pieces of silver. Unquote. So this is actually kind of reminiscent of, again, the last election we just had. Hillary Clinton actually received more popular votes than Donald Trump. Yet because of where those votes came from, Donald Trump received more electoral votes and in order to win the presidency you have to have today you have to have 270 well he received more than that and that therefore that is why Donald Trump won so there's a lot of people that are upset and are still bringing up the fact that Hillary Clinton was more popular yet didn't win and that's happened on occasion so now we're going to talk about uh, the presidency of John Quincy Adams, who is the son, was the son, of the second president of the United States, John Adams. So here is uh, a map, and you can tell with all the green that Jackson received the most popular votes and the most electoral votes, but again, here 38%, he did not receive the majority. You have to have 50, over 50% 50 of the electoral votes to move on, to become president. So that's why these three were put to the House. And then Henry Clay supported Adams over Jackson. And that's why John Quincy Adams won the presidency. And Jackson was pissed. So there you go. Okay, so this is a not a playbill, but a, a bill, like a, a pamphlet that would be, or a poster that would be posted out on the walls of wherever, um, you know, to get campaign for president. And I love this one because it says John Quincy Adams for president of these United States. Like John Adams, but Quincier. <laughs> I think that is hilarious. Okay, so he's going to be just like his dad, but he's Quincier, which was his middle name, and I don't even know what Quincier means. So, um, interesting political campaigning going on right here. Anyway, there you go. So John Quincy Adams was one of the most brilliant and well-qualified men ever to occupy the White House, and they, arguably. But according to digital history, they think so. He was a deeply religious, intensely scholarly man. He read biblical passages at least three times a day, one in English, one in German, and one in French. He was fluent in seven foreign languages, including Greek and Latin. During his remarkable career as a diplomat and secretary of state, he negotiated the treaty that ended the War of 1812. I remember the Treaty of Ghent? He helped acquire Florida 
and he came up with the Monroe Doctrine. But the big thing that Adams lacked was the political skills and personality necessary to create support for his presidency. Like his father, Adams lacked personal warmth. His enemies mockingly described him as a, quote, chip off the old iceberg, end quote. Adams' problems as president did not arise exclusively, exclusively from his temperament, though. His misfortune was to serve as president at a time of growing partisan divisions. So there's lots of um, conflict that divided a lot of people, and he happened to be president during that time. The Republican Party had split into dis two distinct camps. Adams and his supporters, known as National Republicans, favored a vigorous role for the central government in promoting national economic growth, while the Jacksonian Democrats demanded a limited government and strict adherence to laissez-faire principles, which means hands-off businesses without a whole lot of um, government interference. As the only president to lose both the popular vote and the electoral vote, Adam, Adams faced hostility from the start. Jackson and his supporters accused the new president of corruptions and intrigues to gain Henry Clay's support. Though acutely aware of the fact that two-thirds of the whole people were adverse to his election as president, Adams promised in his inaugural address to make up for this with intentions upright and pure, a heart devoted to the welfare of our country. He was a huge nationalist, so Adams proposed an extraordinary program of federal support for scientific and economic development that included a national university, astronomical observations, quote, lighthouses of the skies, end quote, federal funding for roads and canals and exploration of the country's territory, all to be financed by a high tariff. Tariff means a tax on imports. That's going to be a huge in his presidency. I would circle, highlight, underline tariff right now. Unfortunately, Adams' advocacy of a strong federal government and a high tariff enraged defenders of slavery and states' rights advocates who clung to the traditional Jeffersonian principles of limited government and strict construction of the Constitution. Adams met with further frustration because he was unwilling to adapt to the practical demands of politics. Adams made no effort to use his patronage powers to build support for his proposals and refused to fire federal office holders who openly opposed his policies. During his entire term in office, he removed just 12 incumbents, and these only for gross incompetence. He justified his actions by saying that he did not want to make government a perpetual and unremitting scramble for office, meaning he didn't want to fire people who were against him because they may have good ideas, but also if they're just going to, he's just going to put in people he likes, then people are going to try to suck up to him. And that's not how government should be. Adams' Indian policies also cost him supporters. Although he, like James Monroe, wanted to remove Native Americans in the south to an area west of the Mississippi River, he actually believed that the state and federal governments had a duty to abide by Indian treaties and to purchase, not merely annex, Indian lands. Adams' decisions to repudiate and renegotiate a fraudulent treaty that stripped the Georgia Creek Indians of their land outraged land-hungry Southerners and Westerners. So he actually wanted to, you know, do right by Native Americans by legitimately trying to go by the treaties that the government set up instead of just taking their land. And a lot of people were upset at that. Okay, let's see what else. Even in the realm of foreign policy, his strong suit prior to the presidency, Adams encountered difficulties. He attempted to acquire Texas from Mexico through peaceful means, but it failed, as it did his efforts to persuade Britain to permit more American trade with the British, British West Indies. The American system and the tariff of abominations, President Adams was committed to using the federal government to promote national economic development. 
His program included high protective tariffs to promote industry and the sale of public lands at low prices to encourage Western settlement, federally financed transportation improvements, expanded markets for Western gain, grain and Southern cotton, and a strong national bank to regulate the economy. So he's trying to promote growth through all out the United States, but of course, never, not everybody's going to be pleased. You can't please everyone. It's just there's no, per, no, no possible way to do that. And of course, the Southerners are going to be angry because they think that his program is only supporting the, North, uh, the New England states where he's from. So Andrew Jackson's supporters reacted in a big way. So they tried to embarrass Adams and help Jackson win the presidency in the next election. They created a bill which became known as the Tariff of Abominations to win support for Jackson in Kentucky, Missouri, New York, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, while weakening the Adams administration in New England. The bill raised duties on iron, hemp, and flax, which would benefit Westerners, while lowering the tariff on woolen goods to to the detriment of New England textile manufacturers. So they're basically trying to get back at Adams and raise taxes on things that would harm um, New England and help the Western um, territories and states. The tariff of abominations unfortunately created a huge uproar in the South where it was denounced as unconstitutional and discriminatory, which it was. <laughs> um, South Carolina expressed the loudest outcry against the tariff. At a public meeting in Charleston, protesters declared that a tariff was designed to benefit one class of citizens at the expense of every other class. Though some Southern Caroline Carolinians called for revolutionary defiance of the national government. So the Jackson campaign in 1828 was the first to appeal directly for voter support through a professional political organization, meaning that there were skilled politi uh, political organizers like Martin Van Buren of New York, Amos Kendall of Kentucky, and Thomas Ritchie of Virginia. They all created an extensive network of campaign committees and subcommittees to organize these rallies, the parades, barbecues, and to erect hickory poles, which were Jackson's symbol because he, uh, his his nickname was Old Hickory, which is a really tough, sturdy wood. For the first time in American history, a presidential election was the focus of public attention and voter participation increased dramatically. Twice as many voters cast their ballots in the election of 1828 as in 1824, four times as many as in 1820. As in most previous elections, the vote divided along sectional lines, meaning um, like the northern states went one way and the southern states went one other way and the western states went another. Jackson swept every state in the south and west and Adams won the electoral votes in, of every state in the north except Pennsylvania and part of New York. Contemporaries interpreted Jackson's resounding victory as a triumph for political democracy. Jackson's supporters called the vote a victory for the farmers and mechanics of the country over the rich and the well-born. So even Jackson's opponents agreed that the election marked a watershed in the nation's political history, signaling the beginning of a new democratic age. One Adams supporter said bluntly, a great revolution has taken place. So there you go. And here's part of a coffin handbill trying to discredit General Jackson. Um, he did kill many people as uh, a, an army general, of course, um, but he also was famous for his dueling. So in the, the bottom picture here on the left um, is a drawing of, you know, taking around. And it's kind of weird, but symbols are important. So here's the hickory pole supporting, and you can see all the, par the parade goers who's in the parade and those who are supporting in these um, signs back here. So obviously they're supporting 
Old Hickory, a.k.a. Andrew Jackson. So who was Andrew Jackson? In certain respects, Jackson was a truly self-made man. He was born in 1767 in a frontier region along the North and South Carolina border. He was the first president to be born in a log cabin. His father, a poor farmer from Northern Ireland, died two weeks before his birth, while his mother and two brothers died during the American Revolution. At the age of 13, Jackson volunteered to fight in the American Revolution. He was taken prisoner, and a British officer severely slashed Jackson's hand and head when the boy refused to shine the officer's shoes. Jackson soon rose from poverty to a career in law and politics, becoming Tennessee's first congressman, a senator, and a judge on the state Supreme Court. Although later he would gain uh, a reputation as the champion of the common people, in Tennessee he was allied by marriage, business, and political ties to the state's elite. As a land speculator, cotton planter, and attorney, he had accumulated a large personal fortune and acquired more than a hundred slaves. His candidacy for the presidency was initially promoted by speculators, creditors, and the elite leaders in Tennessee who had hoped to exploit Jackson's popularity in order to combat anti-banking sentiment and fend off challenges to their dominance of state politics. So I'm sure his public persona was for the common man, but he also had a huge ties to the rich and the elite. So he's kind of a catch-22, supposedly. And here is the map or the outcome of the election. We already know that he won not only the popular vote, but also the majority of the electoral vote, which is really what is important here. So, one of the most, conf uh, one of the biggest conflicts, I guess we could say, during Jackson's presidency was something called nullification. This was a big deal. So there were a lot of sectional disputes, and again, what I mean by sectional disputes is the sections of the United States, and basically it was drawn out as the northern states, the southern states, and the western states. And one um, particular conflict was over public land. In 1820, to promote the establishment of farms, Congress encouraged the rapid sale of public land by reducing the minimum land purchase from 160 to just 80 acres at a price of $1.25 per acre. So they're trying to limit, not limit, but reduce the amount of land and how much it costs so it would be open for more people. Some groups favored even easier terms for land sales. Squatters, for example, who violated federal laws that forbade settlement prior to the com completion of public sur surveys, pressured Congress to adopt preemption acts that would permit them to buy the land they occupied at the minimum price of $1.25 when it came up for sale. And we talked about this in the Western or, or you will talk more about this in Westward Expansion. So that'll come up again. City working men agitating under the slogan, Vote Yourself a Farm, demanded free homesteads for any American who would settle the public domain. Transportation companies, which built roads, canals, and later railroads, called for grants of public land to help fund their projects. So there are many, many different people looking for land. And there's lots of different ways to shell out that land. Either give it out for free or reduce the price so that more people can purchase it. And basically those were the two proposals. Distribution and graduation. Under the distribution proposal, which was identified with Henry Clay, Congress would distribute the proceeds from the sale of public lands to the states, which would use it to finance transportation improvements. So basically, the land that was sold to individuals, that money would go back to the state so they can use it to improve roads and finance um, railroads that went through those kind of things. Senator Thomas Hartbitten of Missouri offered an alternative proposal called graduation. He proposed that Congress gradually reduce the price of unsold government land and finally freely give it away unpurchased land. 
and if you um, if you've seen the movie Far and Away or know anything about Oklahoma history uh, they had they actually did that and you would uh, there was an, a race to go claim or stake your claim of land um, sorry uh, so that actually happened so in 1829, uh, a senator proposed actually stopping the sale of public lands. Um, so this transformed the debate over public lands into a sectional battle over the nature of the union. So Senator Benton denounced the proposal as an attempt by manufacturers to keep laborers from settling the West, fearing that westward migration would reduce the size of the urban workforce and therefore raise their wage costs. So basically what they're saying is, hey, if you're going to stop selling land, then it prevents people from going out there and settling it. And um, you're just trying to prevent people from going out there so you can keep workers in your factory so you can make money. So basically the result of this was, again, sectional divisions. It was basically the North versus the West and the South further making you know, the divide. So the whole dispute is about land and resources, particularly resources in the land and the people who work it. So eventually this is going to go, this is going to boil down to money and slavery, if you're getting the idea about this. So Daniel Webster of Massachusetts answered um, one of the senators who, who, uh, what am I trying to say, to, um, like, went against it. Um, Daniel Webster made one of his most famous speeches in American history. The United States, Webster proclaimed, was not simply a compact of the states. It was a creation of the people who had invested the Constitution and the national government with ultimate sovereignty. If a state disagreed with an action of the federal government, it had a right to sue in federal court or seek to amend the Constitution, but it had no right to nullify a federal law. That would inevitably lead to anarchy and civil war. It was delusion and folly to think that Americans could have liberty first and union afterwards, Webster declared. Liberty and union now and forever, one and inseparable. So there were some states that were like, mm, I don't think I'm going to listen to you. And, uh, and I'm going to disregard you know, the constitutional law. Um, Daniel, Web this is what Daniel Webster said. Um, the vice president, John C. Calhoun, was actually in favor of having states nullify or disregard the law. Now Jackson, Andrew Jackson, on the other hand, revealed his position on the question of states' rights and nullification at a Jefferson Day dinner on April 13, 1830. He fixed his eyes on his vice president, John C. Calhoun, and he expressed his sentiments with a toast. Quote, Our union, it must be preserved. End quote. Calhoun responded to Jackson's challenge and offered the next toast. Quote, the union, next to our liberty, most dear. May we always remember that it can only be preserved by distributing equally the benefits and burdens of the union. End quote. So needless to say, you have a president who's for one thing and your vice president for another, and now they are in conflict with one another even more so. And it's, it's no bueno. So one of the things that Jackson, one of the things that Jackson tried to do to you know, placate or soften the blow, so to speak, for the Southerners who were angry at this um, land issue was to lower tariffs. So tariffs, again, are taxes on imports and exports. 
Revenue from the existing tariff, together with the sale of public lands, was so high that the federal debt was quickly being paid off. And in fact, on January 1st, 1835, the United States Treasury had a balance of $440,000, not a penny of which was owed to anyone. This is the only time in U.S. history when the government was completely free of debt. So think about that. He, he instituted this high tariff. It actually benefited the United States. We didn't owe any money to anybody. That is incredible. And they actually had a surplus. Today, we're at like $19 trillion into debt. It's no bueno. The new tariff adopted in 1832 was somewhat lower than the tariff of 1825, but still maintained the principle of protection. But the Southerners, again, didn't like it because they felt like it favored the North over the South because they're the ones that are manufacturing these goods that are being exported and uh, so they're therefore getting money and the southerners are doing agricultural things that really maintain or stay within the south and so they're not or not the south but the united states so they're they're they aren't benefiting because they're not getting taxes tax money from it so again it's this us versus them so of course south carolina steps up and is like mm, you know what not going to pay the tax not going to not going to enforce it this this law is null and void and we're not going to pay it to defend their position they voted to raise an army okay so they're saying hey we're going to defend ourselves and we're not going to follow this law that this, the United States Congress has passed. So Andrew Jackson on the hand, other hand, then he said, you know what Congress, um, you're going to have to give me the power to enforce this law. And they passed a bill called the Force Act. Privately Jackson threatened to hang every leader of that infatuated people, sir, by martial law, irrespective of his name or political or social position. He actually sent out a fleet of eight ships and a shipment of 5,000 muskets to Fort Pickney, a federal fort in Charleston Harbor, to make sure that South Carolina was to comply with the, the law. But Henry Clay came to the rescue. So Henry Clay has done a lot of compromises. So he got the nickname Great Compromiser. Quote, he who loves the Union must desire to see this agitating question brought to a termination, he said. In less than a month, he persuaded Congress to enact a compromise tariff with lower levels of protection. So the South Carolin Carolinians backed down, and they rescinded the ordinance nullifying the federal tariff. And as a final gesture of defiance, however, the state adopted an ordinance to nullify the Force Act. So, I mean, they're like, fine, we'll follow this other law, but we're not going to listen to the other. So, I mean, it was kind of ridiculous but again and South Carolina is almost also famous for the first state to secede from the Union when the Civil War started as well as firing the first shots of the Civil War so um, they kind of are the most outspoken in any of these things that we've talked about so far Okay, so nullification was a big deal. Another big deal during Jackson's presidency was something called the Bank War. And it was about the second United States Bank. The banking system at the time Jackson was president was completely di different than it is today. So back then the federal government coined only a limited supply of hard money and printed no paper money at all. So basically the money that was that people had in their hand was coins. And they may have had papers that said, hey, you can have credit from this bank. The principal source of circulating currency or paper banknotes was private commercial banks. And so these were created in various states. So these 
banks supplied the credit necessary to finance land purchases, business operations, and economic growth. And the notes they issued were promises to pay in gold or silver, but they were backed by a limited amount of gold or silver, and the value of gold and silver went up dramatically, up and down, um, so it wasn't the same every day. In 1816, the federal government had chartered the Second Bank of the United States to try and watch the state banks um, and make sure they're doing what they say they're doing. But the idea of this national bank was a, very unpopular for a lot of reasons. They thought uh, that it was cause for the Panic of 1819. They thought that it had too much political influence and the private banks resented someone watching over them, basically. Jackson, and Andrew Jackson, actually disapproved of the bank as well. He felt like it cheated small farmers um, and it wasn't fair to the little people, so to speak. And so he vetoed a bill to recharter the bank. Now initially it did actually help to create an economic boom, but a couple of years later there was a national depression and a lot of the blame was create, uh, well, put on Andrew Jackson when he vetoed this bank. So historians, uh, let's see, where am I? <laughs> the effect of Jackson's banking policies remains a subject of debate. Initially, the land sales, canal construction, cotton production, and manufacturing boomed following Jackson's decide, decision to divert federal funds from the bank. At the same time, state debts rose sharply, inflation increased dramatically. Prices climbed 28% in just three years. Then in 1837, just after the election of Jackson's successor, Van Buren, there was a deep financial depression and they kind of blamed it on the bank issue. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Last but certainly not least. Oh, hold on. All right, so this particular political cartoon was at the beginning of this lecture. Um, did you figure out if this was positive or negative? It's negative. Remember I told you that his campaign, you know, he was promoting the little people or the common person and he had, you know, knew what it was like to be poor, those kind of things, where in this particular political cartoon, he is depicted as a king, as one of those elites that a lot of people were not in favor of. And in one hand, he has a paper that says veto. So he vetoed the second bank of the United States and he's standing on what? The constitution that has been ripped apart. So these are obvious, this was obviously written or drawn by an enemy of Andrew Jackson, uh, expressing how he feels at his presidency. All right, now, last but not least, we gotta talk about the Whigs. Although it took a number of years for Jackson's enemies to come together into an effective national political party, by the mid-1830s, the Whig Party was able to battle the Democratic Party on almost equal terms throughout the country. So the Whig Party was formed in 1834 um, with the alliance of national Republicans, anti-Masons, and disgruntled Democrats who, who didn't like King Andrew Jackson and his use of congressional and judicial authority. The, the party took its name from the 17th century British Whig group that had defended English liberties against the uh, use of pro-Catholic Stuart Kings. And the Whigs that you see on the slide are from the 17th century. So there you go. 
So to try to defeat Andrew Jackson, the Whigs um, mounted their first presidential campaign running three candidates against Martin Van Buren because Martin Van Buren supported Andrew Jackson. Uh, those candidates were Daniel Webster, Hugh Lawson White, and William Henry Harrison. And by the way, Hen William Henry Harrison was the governor of Illinois that Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa spoke to, or tried to persuade him to do some things for the Native Americans. The party strategy was to throw the election into the House of Representatives, where the Whigs would unite behind a single candidate. Because of that, Van Buren easily defeated all his Whig opponents. So Van Buren um, was president for four more years. So what the Whig party decided to do after that was front William Henry Harrison, and he received a united support of the Whig party in 1840. And he actually defeated Van Buren by a vote of 234 to 60 in the Electoral College. Unfortunately, the 68-year-old Harrison caught cold while delivering a two-hour inaugural address in the freezing rain. And barely a month later, he died of pneumonia, the first president to die in office. His vice president was John Tyler of Virginia, and he was a defender of slavery and an advocate of states' rights, and he was a former Democrat. Though he was a firm believer on the principle that the federal government should exercise no powers other than those expressly given to them in the Constitution. And he basically went against the Whig Party in all their principles. So he did his own thing. So the next time it was... <laughs> so, hold on, let me back up. The Whig Party obviously was furious and an angry mob gathered at the White House and threw rocks through the windows and burned a statue of the president in effigy. Uh, to pro protest Tyler's rejection of the Whig political agenda, all members of the cabinet but one resigned. That's like all of his, his, his advisories just like quit on him. I was like, see ya. He had a nickname and his nickname was His Accidency. Like the Democrats, the Whigs were a, an alliance of different interests, and sometimes that can actually be not good because then some of those interests are like, well, we defeated the Democrats, I don't want to be part of this anymore, so they'll leave. And basically, in 1848 and 1852, the Whigs tried to repeat their success. Um, by specifically nominating military heroes for the presidency. And the party did win an 1848 election with General Zachary Taylor. Um, he was known as Old Rough and Ready. But he died just one year and 127 days in office. Now in 1852, the Whigs nominated another Indian fighter and Mexican War hero, General Winfield Scott. And he did not win. He was, his nickname was Old Fuss and Feathers. Uh, and it was the last Whig nominee to play an important role in a presidential election. So there were too many internal conflicts because of these different interests, and the Whig party died out. Eventually, it would be sucked into another political party, which we know today as the Republican Party. Now, I know this was very long, uh, but it's very important. And um, thanks for listening to the whole thing. Kudos to you because there's going to be a quiz after this. And if you took notes, then you can use them. There you go. Otherwise, you'll probably have to retake and retake and retake again. Anyway, now I'm done speaking and, and used up a lot of my spit. So there you go. Thanks for listening.